So I'm going to talk to you about um, cross-site recast forgery attacks today, um, mostly about the CSRF guard project. But since I know for a fact that there are a lot of people who have uh, trouble understanding all the corner cases and all the scenarios that a CSRF attack might uh, require, I'm going to start with the basics. So what is actually a cross-site recast forgery? It has multiple names like CSERF, XSRF, session riding, and confused deputy problem. It is a type of attack where a user is tricked into unknowingly submit a malicious request on a website where he has privileged access to. And the requests are, it's really important, are made blindly on behalf of the victim, inheriting its identity and privileges. This is basically possible because the browser automatically sends existing cookies basic authentication headers, client certificates within the same domain or subdomains. If uh, a cookie is actually set to a top level domain, then it will be shared with all its subdomains, uh, but it's important that it does not work the other way around. There's another subset of uh, CSRF attacks, which is um, called login CSRF, where um, an attacker actually tricking a user into logging in uh, to a website using a predefined set of credentials so that later on an attacker could review the activity log on his machine. So a little bit of history um, actually started. The first attacks were um, identified in 2001, but the major or um, more famous ones were uh, started between 2006 and actually towards 2013. And one of the most famous attacks and um, actually the one that kind of um, was modeled in a lot of uh, CSRF examples was the ING di uh, direct attack where an attacker could possibly transfer money um, and steal money from, from their victims. That was uh, using Firefox 2.0 and Internet Explorer 7. Uh, but also uh, lately, even in 2017, there was a router DNS change campaign or actually a lot of them or sub campaigns. Uh, so it might be still relevant um, in uh, some cases. In 2020, um, uh, CSR vulnerability uh, costed around $5,000 on bounty platforms. But nowadays, uh, in many of the cases, people consider the severity um, rather low. So the classic example, how would an attack um, would happen actually? First of all, um, a simple user, whoever, a victim would log into his banking account in the browser and he would leave his um, maybe tab open. He would, it's not even necessarily um, um, a mandatory, but so to say in the meantime, he would probably receive a mail from an attacker who crafted um, a URL or maybe just a simple image tag uh, sent through the uh, email. And when the victim would click on it, it would create a request with the credentials already stored, the session cookies um, of the uh, banking website. And this way, uh, since the browser would not be able to um, differentiate whether the request was coming from a legitimate user or not, uh, the transfer would happen. This is, of course, not possible. Um, lately at all so maybe another more recent example would look like um, this one which was the novidad infection chain um, and actually it's um, it had a new version of it an attack that happened uh, in brazil in 2020 uh, q4 and there were even some um, some cases in the first quarter of this year so there would be, again, some kind of a malvertising uh, or a compromised website 
or uh, some social engineering, an attacker would send uh, some links to um, a specific user. And if the user would be logged in to his uh, router, then um, first those scripts would try to um, would try to guess the IP address of the routers. If for some reason there would not be an active session, then it would try to uh, guess the credentials required for that specific router after identification. And since a lot of people uses default passwords, um, they might be able to just do that easily. Then uh, with the CSRF attack uh, or another one, actually they could change the DNS settings, the domain name server settings uh, within the router. And that would result in um, quite a serious attack because everyone who would uh, join that same network when they would try to access um, services known by them, uh, they might be redirected to a phishing web server where uh, actually the attackers could steal their uh, credentials and they could just redirect them to, to the um, original sites. So they might not even uh, realize what happened. So uh, you might ask, you know, uh, whether is that really simple and why not? Because actually there is the same origin policy that was introduced in uh, 95 by Netscape Navigator, which basically permits scripts to access data um, from another page only if they sh share the same origin. The purpose of this policy obviously is to prevent malicious scripts from accessing, accessing sensitive data from another web page. And it is worth mentioning that uh, the same or origin policy only applies to scripts and fonts. And writing data is still permitted uh, in, in certain cases. And just to have an idea, uh, our origin is, yeah, this should be visible, just a sec consists of the scheme, a host, and a port. But it also worth mentioning that there are some, um, some um, special cases like Internet Explorer, which um, doesn't consider the port uh, as part of the origin. Or if it's, the site is within a trusted zone, then um, those sites can communicate um, between each other. So how can you relax uh, the same origin policy? there is uh, the first of the options is the cross document messaging. Um, this is not that widely used. Uh, the main idea in this case is that um, the receivers need to um, set up event listeners for, for the message um, string. And normally if you would use something like this, it would require uh, on the, client side, I mean, on the server side to on the receiver side, actually, to check for the origin headers. There's also web sockets. Um, again, the SOP is not applied to web sockets. And um, it's worth mentioning again that the origin header, which uh, is part of um, the forbidden headers list, uh, which means that scripts cannot actually um, modify it or set it explicitly, um, the browser makes um, makes that implicit uh, for every connection request. Again, this is something that um, usually people don't really care about or don't really know about. And um, even in this case, you would need to check or validate the origin against the whitelist before accepting a connection. Moving forward, there's also another historical uh, way of, let's say, working around the SOP, which is JSONP, JSON with padding. Uh, since by default scripts are allowed to be loaded from other domains, um, this could work, but it means that the server endpoint must accept a client callback parameter and return the data wrapped with that, uh, with that function. 
So for an example, if um, the client would make a request against the user's endpoint, he would need to um, provide a JavaScript function as a callback, and then the server would wrap the data and would send it back that way. So the JavaScript would be uh, executed. Of course, this is not a really good idea uh, from a security point of view. So make sure you don't use it. So the question is, are there anything else? Yes, of course. This is the cross-origin resource sharing, which allows restricted resources on a web page to be requested from another domain. Um, asynchronous JavaScript uh, requests are forbidden to make course requests by default because of the same origin policy. And the browser and the server decides with the help of the course whether a request is safe to be served or not. For uh, requests with possible side effects, the browser automatically sends a pre-flight, an optional request to check whether the real request should be allowed to be sent or not. So when it's um, considered to be safe, uh, those are the simple requests. And the conditions for a simple request are that the HTTP verb must be one of the, those three, like get, head, and post. Uh, there shouldn't be any custom headers present. The content type of the request should be one of those three, like um, URL encoded, form data, or plain text. And um, if the request was made using an a XML HTTP request without sending credentials, uh, and no event listeners are registered to read the response. So basically, if, um, if an event listener is registered to read the response or it is added um, by a JavaScript logic in the meantime or to monitor the response or the, uh, or the upload or a readable stream object is used, then um, this request will be blocked. Uh, some browsers will trigger a pre-flight check even if uh, any of the permitted headers contain non-standard values. So for example, if you would say um, you would give a value for the content type, something else than, um, I don't know, maybe a, a random value. Um, I believe this is how um, some of the browsers, uh, for example, on, on uh, iOS work. So um, what are the server-side headers that are required to actually enable course? So one of the um, most important is the access control allow origin, which um, basically configures which ori origins to receive requests from. This could be, and in many of the misconfigurations, in the use cases, this is only um, can can be used like a wildcard, which would accept all origins. There's then the access control allow credentials. Um, this decides whether sending credentials are allowed. Like I said, um, session cookies, basic authentication, uh, client certificates, and so on. Uh, what kind of headers are allowed? Custom headers. Uh, in case of uh, course requests and what kind of headers will be sent back to the clients. There's also another one, um, access control allow methods, uh, which decides which HTTP request type verbs the server accepts in case of a cross-origin request. Uh, it's important to mention that um, browsers uh, now are requesting that uh, if the credentials header is set to accept uh, passed in credentials, then uh, you are not allowed to use the wildcard character in the origin, um, basically for security reasons. Now, um, some real world examples of CSRF attacks uh, and yeah, basically the payloads of them. The first that you can see is um, against TP-Link routers. 
and it's basically a DNS change with CSRF via CSS import, uh, which changes in the example, the DNS name server to a certain uh, malicious IP address and the alternative DNS name server to um, Google's public DNS. So in case, uh, in case they would not be able to serve the request, then it will be resolved by, by Google. Um, and the another one is uh, something similar, uh, but it's actually a post uh, request using a form. And what it does is sets the remote management on a router to be accessible uh, by the attacker. And it also overrides the HTTP password and uh, some other parameters to be able to uh, remotely access the router. So I was curious to see um, what public exploits are there currently. So doing a quick search on exploit DB returned um, quite a few uh, results. And actually looking into it, just to see uh, whether there were any payloads um, in the last two years, it seems that uh, based on my query, um, there were around 123 um, exploits made public on, uh, on the exploit DB. So the question is uh, how to prevent it, right? So, Let's see. The first um, and most recommended way of um, prevention usually is um, synchronizer tokens. This is actually what uh, is implemented within the CSRF guard. Uh, another one is double submit cookie, which is again, um, cryptographically strong random value, which is sent back as a as a um, cookie and the request parameter or a header. Um, the advantage of it is that it's really easy to implement and basically the server would just check whether the, uh, the cookie value matches the header that has been sent along with the request. Uh, moving forward, yeah, there are some uh, defense in depth mitigations like the same site cookie. This is actually the most promising from, uh, from all of those. Um, another thing that you can do is to use custom request headers, uh, which can also be configured within CSRF guard and checking the origin or referer headers, because those are again, um, as I said, the origin and Actually, the referer header uh, itself as well are part of the forbidden headers, so scripts cannot um, manually tamper with it. So it's in many of the or most of the cases, it's safe to um, safe to check against. Um, and yeah, uh, one of the most again uh, important things would be to follow. Um, the basic REST principles, for example, do not use GET methods for state changing operations. And yeah, one of the prerequisites of uh, CSRF mitigation techniques is not to have cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities within your application, because that way um, an attacker could defeat all the mitigation techniques. Um, this could also depend, you know, uh, if you can configure uh, all the major um, attributes within CSRF guard, then it will be slightly harder to do so, but um, still it, it can be done. So the same site attribute, that's basically a game changer because it allows restricting the cookie context to a first party or a same, same site context. 
it can have the following three values um, LAX when cookies are not sent on normal cross site requests, but are sent when navigation to the origin site happens. So this is rather for top level navigation and only accept, uh, accept safe methods, which are get head options and trace. Um, there's a more strict uh, version of it when uh, the cookies will not be sent along with the request initiated by a third party website. This practically means that uh, if someone would send you a link, um, let's say on a um, private message channel or so, if you would click on it, you would be redirected to um, the particular site that you might be logged in, but it will show you uh, as, as if you were not. You would need to do a reload or a refresh in your browser uh, to be logged in. And the third option would be none. Well, um, that's basically uh, how the internet worked for, for um, a lot of years right, right now. And that basically means that the cookies are uh, being sent in all contexts. Uh, there's also uh, a few um, new requirements with regards to this uh, non-flag is that it must be accompanied by the secure flag otherwise the cookie will not be uh, will not be sent if a server omits sending this attribute some browsers will default to lags after two minutes um, when the cookie was created uh, and actually, this is something pretty new that was introduced in uh, 2020, I believe, uh, by the Chromium project. And since then, uh, other browsers are starting to, to default to that as well. So for example, right now, if you would be using Chrome, then uh, this is the default um, that you would see in your browser. So when you would need CSRF guard then? Well, there are a couple of, um, a couple of use cases. One would be uh, when you need to support users with all their browsers, for example, uh, Internet Explorer, which still has like uh, one year to live. And basically same site is not supported at all in Internet Explorers or if you have endpoints that enable state changing operations through get methods, uh, or you are using a framework, maybe even in legacy code or so, I've seen quite a few examples like this, uh, where the framework permits um, HTTP verb interchangeability. So basically there, uh, the logic is, uh, when you invoke a get method, it automatically delegates to a post so basically they are interchangeable. And another use case is uh, when you might need to disable the same site attribute is when you integrate with third-party services. For example, if you would use authentication via SAML um, and the identity provider is on another domain or so. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that currently Safari does not default to Lex nor Firefox before the version 69 and nor Firefox for Android before uh, version 79. So you will still see a lot of users um, who might be vulnerable. So how does the application works? So if you are using an HTML or a JavaScript front-end, first the HTML needs to load or refer to the JavaScript script, which is uh, by default under the JavaScript servlet endpoint. This servlet would return the JavaScript logic together with a master token. If you have token per page enabled, then it would send another request to the same servlet together with the master token itself to query the page tokens. Again, if you have a uh, token pre-create enabled because you might have a, a smaller application or so, the servlet will return a list of um, 
the list of the, all the endpoints within the application and their assigned CSRF tokens. Otherwise, it only returns pages that were accessed since the logical session creation. Uh, from this point on, all pages require a token to be sent along, either their dedicated token or the master token at the first use, after which a new page token will be created and sent back to the client. So moving on, um, if you configure to use single use tokens, then after every usage, the token will be destroyed and a new one will be assigned um, through a response header. So you won't be able to use the previous token or reuse the previous token, better said. Uh, there's also um, a strict domain check option for the JavaScript endpoint uh, that would not serve, if enabled, that would not serve um, the um, JavaScript logic itself and the uh, CSRF tokens uh, to requests that were made from another domain. Also, there's a referrer header check that you can enable that um, would also require a matching protocol, a matching domain, and there is an option to define a pattern, uh, a regular expression um, that would actually act as a whitelist for the, for the origins that are accepted. Besides that, there's also JSP taglib support, uh, in which case tokens are injected on the server side and you don't need to use the, um, you don't need to use the servlet for the JavaScript anymore. And actually it would also give you um, an error of 400 um, if you are trying to, to do that. So what's new in CSRF Guard 4.x? Uh, first of all, it was heavily refactored, improved and optimized. Uh, the modules were separated um, into distinct Maven modules and dependencies. Right now, one of the biggest uh, changes that has been introduced is uh, that it now supports stateless web applications. So it, so the, um, tokens are not uh, mapped to session IDs anymore. There is token per page support for Ajax requests, which did not, uh, did not happen before. Um, the master and page token retrieval has been changed. A few race, uh, race conditions have been fixed. We also have token injection into dynamically created content. So in case you have some um, fancy JavaScript logic that would create new elements in the page, um, CSRF guard would automatically inject the relevant tokens to those elements in the DOM as well. A few other bugs that, has been, that have been uh, fixed, like do not inject tokens for unprotected uh, or external links. Um, this was quite important because um, an attacker could trick someone um, into clicking on an external link and then they could save the assigned token to it. And also um, there were some changes with regards to um, a, synch a synchronous Ajax request deprecation uh, the JS code has been changed to be parsable and minifiable and so on and so forth. Actually, uh, you can check the release notes on GitHub. So this is actually a screenshot of the test application that is um, also shipped, so to say, with uh, CSRF guards if you wanted to. So as you can see, uh, on the right side, there is a log that would um, show the master token, the page tokens that were returned based on the master token. And as you can see, there are a few wildcards and regular expressions for different resources. And you can see 
uh, in order how the logic injects the tokens to different DOM elements. Also at the end, there is an update of, um, of the form elements. And then another uh, screenshot with the GSP tech support. I just wanted to show this one that um, it doesn't do any requests in uh, addition to the JSP itself. And even though the, um, the injection has already happened on the server side, this is really convenient and actually more secure. So yeah, basically that's the main a flow that I wanted to, to show you. So I'm going to just jump to some conclusion and recommendations. Uh, yeah. So for developers, um, it is recommended to disable cores or to configure very strict rules uh, for it. Use the same size strict or uh, lax. If required to consider, use two set of cookies one for general access and one for sensitive actions. I believe this is how Amazon does lately. Um, make strict assertions on the content type, require user input or confirmation or re-authentication or any kind of capture for um, critical functionalities. Do not accept get HTTP methods for state changing operations. Consider revoking access from um, users with all browsers based on the user agent, for example, prevent uh, cross-site scripting, make sure that you have strict content security policies like script source and connect source, which would uh, prevent loading scripts from other domains and use anti-CSRF solutions like CSRF guard if necessary. Uh, besides that non-default value slightly increase the complexity of the exploitation. So, make sure that um, you don't go with, uh, with the defaults. For penetration testers, bug bounty hunters, what you can do is to check for the same site um, uh, cookie or attribute is, for, uh, is set for cookies, check for permissive course rules, um, set up your referral policy to no referrer because that way you might be able to bypass some of the validations send uh, plain text content types, but um, pass JSON or XML content within and see whether that works. Reuse CSRF tokens between different sessions or remove the token itself altogether. Uh, try to interchange HTTP methods, try uh, subdomain takeovers and start your attacks from, from there. Or you can try uh, using social, in social, social engineering to trick users into using an insecure browser. This page is only available on Inter Inter Explorer or something like that. What you can also do is to automate your uh, checks using uh, Nuclei. It's an open source vulnerability scanning tool. Um, this is what it returned for uh, our default web application. Also, uh, I've created um, a template, a YAML template that would detect um, different versions of uh, CSRF guard and uh, whether it contains, it has token per page support or not. Uh, also for people, recommendations for people uh, surfing the internet, make sure to use modern and up-to-date web browsers. You can use uh, Firefox container extensions to separate your browser sessions between the tabs, log out from sites that you, uh, after you've finished using them like internet uh, banking or so. Consider using a separate browser or a browser profile for personal use. Uh, do not use extensions that reduce the overall security posture of your browser like disable course or enable course. Uh, and of course, do not download and execute files from unknown sources. Here you can see some references, I believe my time has just passed so uh <laughs> i won't have any time to to show you some demos but i'm gonna upload them maybe in a blog post to github also you can contact me on these um on these following links and of course you can ask 
me anything on Slack or Discord or other ways of um, 